Taika Waititi is directed Jojo Rabbit. Well, he's also written it and starred in it as well. It's done very well this award season, picking up Screen Actors Guild, Writers Guild, Producers Guild, Directors Guild, and Gold Derby Awards, plus six Oscar nominations. Taika is nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Motion Picture. And I'm at Noble Gold Derby to ask Taika, how do you approach making a comedy about Hitler? Um, well, you kind of you approach uh, at night from behind, uh, from behind or flank, or you flank it. You know, it that's how you do it. Yeah. I, you don't not you don't go sort of straight like frontal, full frontal. <clears throat> um, we well when I. Uh, when I first, uh, this is adapted from a book, and so um, when I first read that book in 2010, um, there was just something about this really cool story about a um, a little boy in the Hitler Youth who um, who found a girl living in his attic, and and just how he came to get to know her, and the um, and the way that they began to form a friendship and start to understand each other and bridge the gaps between their cultures. Um, and I needed a way of showing how this little boy uh, was conflicted and he had that part of his conscience was uh, trying to pull him back to the dark side, if you will. And so I needed to show something. And in my own style that, you know, that kind of fit with things that I'm into and my sensibility. And that's where I came up with this idea of an imaginary friend who's constantly trying to talk him out of um, of straying too far from the... Uh, indoctrination that he's um, he's already been through and that's where this idea of hitler came from i thought that if a little boy was going to have an imaginary friend in 1945 who better than, than adolf hitler mm, yeah and i guess what was the biggest challenge for you in uh, making this film well the biggest challenge was um just the, the fact that it's a period film and trying to you know trying to make these films you know in the Using and making things, you know, feel authentic, and and uh, and sourcing all of those props and vehicles and and costumes and everything. That's a big undertaking. Uh, tonally, the, the the when we look at the content of the film and the feeling of the film, that stuff was always going to be difficult to kind of get right. But I've, I've done that with all my films so far. Had that kind of tonal mix and uh, and all that balancing really just come through in the edit after you've shot the film. And there was part of it was in the script in the original screenplay, but uh, it was really the, the main part was, was when, we were, when we were editing, just testing the film again and again with audiences and and just trying to get a feel for like, you know, when we could be funny, when we had to take it more seriously. Um, and, you know, I mean, ultimately the film's a fable and it's, you know, so I was never going to do something that, Super dramatic, or uh, or felt like all the other World War Two films that had gone before it. Yeah, uh, what 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 appealed to you the most about this project? Uh, I think the uh, I think the opportunity to make something that um, that I felt was important, uh, and it's a the commentary not only not just on the war but on the way the people that the on the way that the world is uh seems to be um experiencing hate and intolerance and um and racism and acts of hate and speak hate speech uh that stuff has is kind of come back into fashion and i really wanted to I really wanted to try and address that as best I could, and I I like films that that use comedy to help deliver an important message because I think that it uh, opens audiences up a bit a bit more, makes them more receptive, and I think that they actually um, I think they absorb that message a lot easier when they've been laughing. Yeah, and if you like, if you were to say, what is the sort of driving message of the film that you'd sort of Want an audience member to take take out? Uh, don't be a Nazi. Yeah. 
Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. I think also, I think really the main, the, really the main thing is, um, you know, it's a film about a little boy indoctrinated to hate who's, who's learning how to think for himself and how, you know, and how he can break away from that group think that is responsible for so many hate groups. And, you know, when, when you get enough ignorant people together and teach them one thing, it's quite hard to break them out of that as we keep seeing in you know, many parts of the world um, over history and also right now. And so, mm-hmm. so this idea that it's okay to, to be your own person and to, to try and be kind and do the right thing and be more tolerant of others and inclusive of others, mm-hmm. uh, to see people f- not for their differences but just as, as what they are, which are just human beings, I think that's really the message is just it's more of just a reminder that it's okay to be like that. Yeah, and I guess like in the film what's really interesting is, is through his relationship and actually meeting one of these people that he's been indoctrinated against through which he his eyes could be opened and realize that the sort of the messaging that he'd gotten from the uh the those in power was uh, different to the reality. Yeah, very different. And the way that uh, Jews were portrayed um, mm. and, and the way they were described to young kids um, back then was, uh, was really, uh, you know, it's like it's a, a gross lie. And they were described as, you know, no better than animals. And animals are pretty cool. Mm. But uh, yeah. they, um, you know that they were subhuman. They had horns and you know tails, and that they were kind of like mm. deep. And little kids grew up believing this. And uh, they were part of that is what appealed to me as well. Is that this little kid who believes all that stuff is now confronted by one of these people in his house, and he has to deal with that. And for him, it's like having a monster in the attic. And mm. and yeah, you know, how does he deal with that ten year old who's like got a you know, very vivid, wild imagination. How does he deal with that? Yeah, and you, you say that, like, sort of comedy is a great sort of vessel for delivering powerful messages. I also feel like uh, with a lot of your films from uh, Boyd, Hunt for the Wilder People, also you, you tend to often use children as vessels to uh, tell stories. What do you think is particularly powerful about sort of seeing the world through the eyes of a child? Well, they've um, they've got a more honest way of um, of reflecting on uh, of reflecting what they see, which is the you know usually the grown up world, um, and they've got a uh, they don't they kind of call it uh, how it is, and you know, there's that saying that, that children hold a mirror up to us, and and so what they see and what they comment on and how they see us um, can actually be um, it can be way more profound and powerful than when adults try and interpret this adult world. So that's why, yeah, and I, and that's why I love I love working with uh, young actors is also because the the performances that they give, and especially with actors who have never done any acting before, um, when they capture it, it's um, it's the best performances in the world, and it's better than yeah you know, some of the most seasoned adult actors. We've learned, you know, all these tricks over the years and all these like, you know, little techniques to try and um, try and get across to an audience where kids are just being themselves and uh, there's something so pure that most actors are, are striving for all their lives. But with kids, it just comes naturally because they're not trying. Hmm. You found it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I know definitely. And with um, with with kids, do you find it easier to direct? Children or easy to direct to adults? It's, uh, I'd say that it's easier to, uh, to direct adults just because when you have the right adults, you, you don't have to really, you know, understand the scene or have analyzed the scene, then you might get a few, yeah, you, know, you get, might get more interesting, uh, alternatives and a variation in the types of performance to get, uh, but then, conversely, sometimes uh, they overthink things. Adult actors, they, do, you know, they often they often bring a lot of baggage to their characters, and they often, you know, want to analyze the scenes. And 
can often waste a lot more time with some adult actors. So there's sort of pros and cons with both, but uh, I think children are harder to work with, but the results when you get it right um, are far more special. Mm. And in this film, you were one of the adult actors you had to direct um, as uh, and, and playing Hitler. And you're talking about how sometimes adults can overthink roles. Uh, I imagine for some actors, playing Hitler would be a role that they would, especially in a sort of a comedy, a sort of a farcical type of role, uh, would could uh, get into the danger of overthinking. Uh, how they're going to portray that. How did you find playing Hitler was something you found a lot of fun to sort of have some uh, wax at the guy? Was it a stressful? Thing? Like, how did you find playing Hitler? Um, it wasn't um, It wasn't stressful. I think when I first saw myself in that costume and the makeup and stuff, um, it's not like, it's not, it's not something that you kind of, you get excited by. Um, you sort of just feel like, you know, it's like a little bit of embarrassment because you're like, do I really have to walk around like this? Because it, you just, it just doesn't, it's, it doesn't look cool. You don't yeah. look cool. It's not like, mm. you know, um, dressing up as Batman or something. But, uh, you know, you just look like a kind of clown. And, you, and, and so there's that part of it where you don't feel like you're going to look like, you know, and, and when you're directing as well, you know, it's, you, Got to be when I'm in this. If I was in the scenes with Roman, um, who played Jojo, uh, dressed like that, it would be. It's more just like it's there's a, just this hassle of having to be dressed like that and having to look like that. What's um, well, easy for me is that I didn't put any effort into the actual character because I didn't think that it, I don't think I should, and I didn't think that he deserved it, and I don't think that uh, I don't think the film would be better if it was like a more authentic portrayal of him i feel like it needed to be that level of performance he needs to really because he comes from a 10 year old's mind he needs to be a 10 year old so so yeah i think with other actors they may have put in maybe too much research or something and just think you know if, if it gets too close to the actual person then i think it pulls you out of the film a bit more yeah, because I guess you, you're not actually Hitler, are you? You're a, you're a perception of Hitler. You're someone's yeah, imaginary also, friend. Yeah, yeah. he's also made up of other um, facets of Jojo's uh, mind and his, uh, his personality and his life. People that he, you know, I think part of that Hitler character is also, you know, some part of it is his father. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe he's mm-hmm. just... But yeah, he's, he's probably added some of his father there, probably maybe some school teachers he loves. Um, it's just made up of all the people that he kind of would would like to hang out with, and it's been cobbled together just in his mind. And that's my yeah. for it not looking exactly like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, al- and then lucky you weren't, you're not a method actor and you were having to go home in the costume and uh, all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I probably uh, Yes. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> yes. No. Well, definitely. But um, so, what? Uh, what, was your, what was your favorite scene in the film? What's the moment that you're sort of the most proud of? Or um, I love the there's two moments. My favorite proper scene uh, is with Scarlett and um, and Roman and the, at the dinner table, and she puts this like soot from the fireplace on her face and plays this uh, plays out the scene as. Uh, Basically, between her and her husband um, having a conversation about Jojo, and it's a really lovely scene because it shows a bit about, a bit more about her and her background and who she is, and then uh, and and also it shows the love that she has for her kid. And then my other, my probably my favorite moment in the film is uh, is at the end with what uh, happens when Jojo breaks up with Hitler, and uh, the end of that scene. Well, actually, yeah. the, whole, the whole scene is my favorite. It's, it's, uh, makes me very happy. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, very, it's sort of a very satisfying moment in the film. Uh, do, you have, do you have a favorite uh, line that you, uh, from the film or something that you think is particularly funny? What's the funniest? Uh, the one that makes me smile all the time is when his friend Yorkie, uh, whenever he speaks, really, but like, there's two lines that he has that I, I really love. One when he says, um, oh, good for you, Jojo, a girlfriend. Um, 
And then the other one is when he says uh, that he can never die. And um, yeah, uh, just yeah, there's just something so, so sweet about that that best friend character. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. No, my, 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 I thought the funniest line for me was one of his two where he's talking about how the Japanese aren't particularly Aryan looking. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was, uh, that, was, that, was, that was my line of the film. Um, <laughs> you, um, what was the funnest or, or most uh, exciting moment when shooting the movie? Um, well, the most... The fun, most, I guess the most fun that uh, I had when we were shooting was uh, I think anything like with um, some of the some of the stuff that Stephen would come up with was pretty fun just because you know, mm. I really love that guy. Uh, yeah. There's some good, yeah. I mean, it's just more, more like just discovering that the jokes you've written work. Those those are always fun for someone who's obsessed with their own uh, films and. Someone who's an yeah. ego maniac like myself, but the uh, I think the but I get yeah I think that that scene where he kicks uh, he kicks Hitler out I think yeah. that was the most fun just seeing that like on the on the playback and seeing yeah you know, him getting kicked out again and again as watching it just just filled me with joy being able to do that to Hitler yeah the um. Um, we're an awards website at Gold Derby. Uh, this is not your first time uh, as an Oscar nominee. You were there in two thousand and five for Two Cars One Night, um, so that, which was a, a, a nominee for short live action film. You're now going back as a director or a, and writer and uh, actor in a six nominated Best Picture nominee film. Uh, just. How different is it feeling uh, this time, the sort of awards sort of circus, I guess? Well, this time there's a lot more. I mean, I, I have to put a lot more effort in. With the short film category, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to mm. bother doing any press. or <laughs> like You don't have to promote the film. You don't have to go on the, mm. kind of the awards campaign. Um, but, yeah, this has been really fun for me, actually. I've, really, I've been quite enjoying this whole campaign. Um, it's it's also what well, the coolest thing was being able to just hang out with lots of the other nominees and over the course of the five six weeks that we've been doing it and uh, you know it just gets another because it doesn't feel like a competition at all it feels like in this community of filmmakers everyone's very supportive of each other and no one really cares it's like I guess it'd be nice to get an award but everyone kind of is very aware of like how it works it's voting and it's like sort of just you just do what you can to promote the film and to see what happens and but what's been cool is everyone's been supporting each other along the way and uh you know i think it's more about the community of filmmakers that uh that i've realized is, is very strong and very supportive mm. it's, oh it's not it's been a positive thing yeah, is there anyone you've gotten to meet through this award sort of circuit that's been you've gotten to kick out of uh, I remember, I uh, don't know. I've met so previously. I'd met so many of them before, so I feel like everything I go to, I'm just like catching up with people. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, there will be someone, but I feel like <laughs> it has blended into like just like this big long afternoon of going to. Yeah, life. yeah. What? Also, what 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 do you look for in projects? I guess because like we see, you know, Jojo Rabbit, a very different movie to Thor. Uh, you know, Hunt for the Wilder People, a, a night. Like, what kind of what 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 is the universal quality to sort of all the films you you do? No, no, I feel like that they should all feel different to what I've done before, and that's sort of what what keeps me interested is if it's something that where I feel like, oh, I've never done that. So I guess that could be interesting. And if there's a story in there that feels unique and if, it, if there's a story in there that feels like I'm in, like, I, you know, that I could bear to watch. I mean, I think most filmmakers, when they get into to making a film or writing something or directing it, it's all about, would I really like to see this movie? And, and you start with that and then, and then it's about, 
trying to keep yourself interested in that movie um, over the next year or two that you're making it. Um, yeah. Ironically and sadly, at the end of that whole process, once you've finished the film and delivered it, you've seen it so many times. It's really, it's not, it's not really the kind of film you want to see at all. Yeah. Well, you, you did a bit of work um, on the Mandalorian, which is television. Would you be interested in doing more on TV, where there's that? like sort of you can come back the next year and do some new stuff and things like that yeah yeah i loved uh i loved working on the mandalorian it was really fun and you know, it was well written and what john uh favreau had, uh created and his whole vision for that was um was something that was really uh exciting because it was something because you know i had this sort of like idea of like you know, that I've been told about that he was sort of he was telling me about it before he, he was doing it and I didn't quite understand what he was talking about um, and then it was when I started going down visiting the set and visiting the production and, and getting uh, my head around the whole the whole world and that whole series that um, I started getting really excited and it mm. was really fun doing it I didn't do anything on the second season because I was shooting another film but uh it's uh, it was, I was very proud of that episode that I got to do. Yeah. And uh, there's been some talk about you being involved in Star Wars moving forward. Can you say anything about that? I don't want you to get in trouble. Uh, type. Yeah. Well, I don't know well, that I get in trouble, but, I mean, there's nothing happening. So, it's not, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know I don't even know what to say about it because this doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. No worries at all. And uh, final question, uh, with uh, Jojo Rabbit, um, you were saying that you look for new stories, you look for something different you've never done before in films. What do you think is the unique defining quality of Jojo Rabbit? I think that it's um, just a new way of looking at a subject that we have to keep uh, talking about, we have to con continue to have this conversation about the events of World War Two and and the Holocaust and and what happened, and what human beings did to other human beings, and yeah. the fact that you know, that, you know, seventy five years after the liberation of Auschwitz and eighty years after the beginning of the war, that we are still in danger as human beings of repeating our same mistakes as we as we usually do and so that you know i feel like this if people are going to see a film that uh that's heartfelt and funny and poignant and heartbreaking at times which takes you through the whole gamut of human emotions but ultimately ends with hope and you know with, with positivity which is what I hope that I can do with all my films is to you know, is to have an audience leave feeling feeling happy and feeling hopeful and like and feeling yeah. and feeling upbeat because mm. God knows like you know the world is, there's so many things to bump us out every day in the world right now and I think that so I go to have movies that you know where it, it, you can be positive. Mm. Yes, and I, I think talking about how it's helpful to remember uh, the, the lessons from World War II, we see quite a few movies about that, but very few that um, use comedy to help us remember um, some of the, the, the dangers of human nature that were exhibited there. So yeah. that's really cool. Comedy, comedy yeah. is, is extremely important in that sense, you know, and opening audiences up and making them more receptive to ideas like this. And I think... Without comedy, then I, I don't know if the messages uh, really sink in as, as effectively. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And people's guard can be down a bit more with comedy too. And right. like they can be more open to hearing things. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Uh, Taika, all the best with the Oscars. And uh, there's, I think, a few other awards. We're sort of at the end of the tail end of the season now. Um, all the best for uh, your future projects too. And for anyone watching this video, you can uh, go to goldderby.com to make all your awards predictions and predict the Oscars, uh, compete against the best editors and experts around the world. Uh, thanks very much, Taika. Hey, pleasure. Thank you.